Today we're going to take a look at some common network ports and what their default purpose is. So this is going to be some useful knowledge that really any IT or network person should know, but these are also things that you would need to know if you're studying for say a Network Plus, a Security Plus, or a CCNA exam. So port 20 and 21 are going to be used by the file transfer protocol. This is one of the most common protocols for file transfers, thus the name. Port 20 is used for the actual data transfer and port 21 is the control port used for establishing a connection between the two computers. There's authentication that's built into FTP, so you should configure it with a username and password whenever possible. And there is also default logins that are on a lot of systems like an anonymous user. And it's generally best practice to disable those as well. Any accounts that aren't going to be used by the organization should be turned off. Port 22 is SSH. If you've ever wondered how administrators are able to manage remote servers, this is your answer. SSH stands for Secure Shell. Now, of course, with a shell or a terminal, you're able to do anything that someone might do on the computer with a mouse or keyboard. In fact, several decades ago, before mice and GUIs were common, terminals were really all we had. A secure shell allows you to administer a machine remotely through a terminal. And you could also do that with Telnet, but the big advantage that SSH brings over Telnet is an encrypted connection. That's where the secure part comes from. So if you're using a secure shell with up-to-date encryption, nobody is going to be able to intercept any of your traffic and see any sensitive data that you're interacting with. Now, that Telnet that I mentioned, it works over port 23 by default, and this is a much older protocol that doesn't have any encryption to it. Telnet was developed in 1969 and SSH was created in 1995, so it's truly the boomer protocol. But alas, these protocols are necessary to use in some cases. It's really not that unusual to find very old legacy hardware that's running some kind of specialized application that has no new replacements for that enterprise company. And you might just have to interact with those machines over Telnet if they don't support SSH. So keep that in mind. Uh, your communications with these devices are going to be in the clear. For sending email, we use SMTP on port 25. For receiving email messages, you're probably going to be using IMAP or POP3. Now POP3 stands for the Post Office Protocol version 3, and it operates on TCP port 110. POP3 is not that common these days though because it provides only a very basic mail transfer functionality. IMAP, which operates on TCP 143 by default, also includes the management of email inboxes and the ability to create multiple folders and the ability to manage inboxes from multiple devices. Port 53 is commonly used for DNS or domain name resolution. And this is usually UDP. The other ports that we covered so far were TCP, but DNS is going to use UDP. Anyway, DNS is going to be na used for name resolution because whenever you go to a website like youtube.com, you're not really going to youtube.com. You're communicating with one of Google's many servers that they use for YouTube, which are identified by an IP address. But remembering the IP address of every single website that you want to visit, that would be a real pain. So DNS allows you to just remember the URL instead, kind of like how your contacts in your phone, you can identify them by people or by their pictures instead of having to remember everybody's individual phone numbers. Now, to actually communicate with that web server, we're going to be using either TCP port 80 for HTTP traffic, or more likely TCP port 443 for HTTPS traffic. So the difference between the two is encryption. The older HTTP has no encryption at all, so your communications are gonna be sent in the clear. And if somebody is listening to your traffic on the network, they can see everything that you're doing on that HTTP site. So you'd want to avoid these sites, especially if they require you to input passwords or work with any kind of sensitive information. 
HTTPS, on the other hand, is encrypted, and usually you can tell if you're on an HTTPS site by seeing a green lock in the URL to the left of the URL in your browser. Now, like I said, this encryption is gonna be much more common these days. In fact, most web browsers are going to put warnings and even additional web pages trying to block you from visiting an HTTP site because of the potential danger when traffic isn't being monitored. Uh, sometimes you'll want to manage your computer remotely, but with a GUI instead of just a shell. And this is where RDP, the Remote Desktop Protocol, comes into play. So this protocol works over TCP port 3389. This is a cross-platform protocol, but it's most commonly used on Windows since functionality of that OS is a bit more limited without a GUI. And speaking of Windows, there's another protocol that's commonly used there called SMB or Server Message Block. And this protocol is commonly used on Windows for file sharing, printer sharing, and is sometimes referred to as CIFS, or the Common Internet File System, and uses either port 139 or 445. There's also NetBIOS, which is a more common uh, on older Windows systems and uses UDP port 137 for NetBIOS name services and UDP port 138 for NetBIOS datagram services and TCP 139 for the NetBIOS session service. And of course, since Windows has its own special protocols for transferring files, Apple had to go ahead and make their own too with AFP, so this stands for the Apple Filing Protocol, and this operates on TCP port 548, and in order to view a list of servers, you're probably going to use the service location protocol, which uses TCP port 427 and UDP port 427 to populate lists of available locations. Just like SMB and FTP, you can copy, move, delete, and rename files with AFP. When you first connect a device to a network, it is usually able to get an IP address automatically. And this is because it is using DHCP or the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. This uses UDP port 67 and UDP port 68 to communicate with your UDP server, uh, which is usually just gonna be built into your router software. Um, and that's going to lease an IP address. So this lease will usually have a certain time until it expires, and at that time, the DHCP server is going to ping the device and ask it, does it still need that address? And if the device is still communicating on the network, then the lease is gonna be renewed. If not, then it's gonna be revoked and it can be assigned to another device. If you connect to a corporate network, you usually have to provide some sort of username and password, and these credentials are sent to a centralized database, and the protocol used by this database is commonly LDAP, uh, the Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. And this uses TCP port 389. It's useful for corporate accounts because if you ever need to disable somebody's account or say if you need to create a new one, you can do so in a centralized way. Now, when you're administering a corporate network, you may be in charge of thousands of devices on that network. So it's gonna be really important to gather statistics from all those different network devices so that you can see how they're doing. And a great way to do that is with the Simple Network Management Protocol or SNMP. It uses UDP port 161 to make queries to the devices and it can receive alerts from devices if something happens over UDP port 162. Now for some honorable mentions. If you're just watching this video to study for a CCNA, Security Plus, or Network Plus quiz, you can probably skip these protocols, but it might just be handy for you to know them anyway. Uh, but port 43 is used by the Whois protocol. So this is going to be used for querying databases that store information about the registered user of a domain name or of a block of IP addresses. You may have used a Whois tool online to figure out who the owner of a particular website is before. 
Port 37 is the time protocol, and its purpose was to help computers on a network synchronize their clocks together. Now, the time protocol has pretty much been replaced by NTP, the network time protocol, uh, due to some of its extra features, like the ability to have more than one second of precision on the clock syncs. Uh, the sexiest port of all, port 69, is the Trivial File Transfer Protocol, or TFTP. So this is one of the simplest file transfer protocols in existence, and it's not typically used for transferring files over the internet. Rather, you're going to usually see this used to transfer things like firmware images and configuration files to devices that are on a LAN, such as dedicated firewalls or routers. Now, the big difference between TFTP and FTP and SFTP is the fact that TFTP uses UDP. It's a whole lot of letters right there. Uh, now, of course, UDP is going to be faster, but it is a less reliable protocol than TCP. Uh, and lastly is port 70. So this is going to be the Gopher protocol. Uh, I've actually done an entire video on the Gopher protocol and the Gopher network. Uh, but essentially, it was one of the protocols competing against HTTP in the early days of the internet. So Gopher is a much more minimalist web browser protocol. Uh, there's no images, no multimedia, just text and links. And you also can't view Gopher sites using a regular web browser unless you install the Overbyte WX browser add-on, uh, or if you use a terminal browser like Lynx. So there you go. There's some common network ports and a couple less common network ports uh, and the protocols that are used with them. I hope that you guys found this video useful. Thanks for watching.